Good afternoon. I'm really excited to be here and to kind of share with you my journey of becoming an online educator, um, which uh, I think is going to be joining the choir of our two previous speakers. Um, but also maybe I can share how I feel that there's an intersection between academic medicine and its willingness and openness to thinking about online learning. My name is Sarah Payray. For those of you who I don't know, I wear several hats in the medical center. I am the executive director of our Institute for Innovative Education. I'm also an Associate Dean for Innovative Education, and I'm a professor in surgery, nursing, medical humanities, and bioethics. What that means is um, I love to collaborate, and um, I love that there are huge, tremendous needs around learning and education in the medical center, and they need more people from Warner to get engaged over there and help out with what's happening. To talk about my background, I could tell you I'm an educational psychologist and in my journey, but what I really wanted to do was share a little bit about my framing or how I was approaching my mental model or around being an online teacher. And the first thing you have to know is that I was online fearful. Very recently, I was online fearful. I love being in front of a group. I love the room. I love the laughter and the humor. I think my secret sauce in teaching is to be able to work a room. And online learning seemed like it was going to shut all that down. So I was very nervous about it. And when I thought back about it, I did realize that I was a learner kind of with Blackboard. When I was doing my doctoral program at USC, this would have been 2005-ish, um, I had a Blackboard account. And it's where I went and I got my grades and I got my feedback from my faculty members and I accessed reading, but I wouldn't call that online learning. Um, but it, it left an impression on me. If we think about that as we professionally grow our identities, we marinate in this soup of our training programs and what we're exposed to, I realized that my early exposure with Blackboard left a huge impression on me that it was this container, if you will. It was just a place where you went to go access information, but not something you engaged with. And the next important thing to know about is I have worked for 20 years in an academic medical culture where online learning is predominantly used for compliance and mandatory education. It's not where the fun stuff lives, right? All of the innovation and transformation in medical education has been around simulation and experiential learning, thinking about workplace learning, and that seemed to be on the other end of the spectrum of online learning. And if I was going to present myself as an innovative educator, I was the sparky person that was going to help you do things better, online learning wasn't going to be on my tool belt. And so I had this resistance to it. And then I came to Rochester. And things started shifting and things started changing for me. And I started meeting some educators that I really admire and respect, many of them in this room, who were doing online learning in a meaningful way. And there's this huge paradigm shift. I started thinking the future of education in all professions or in all venues is going to all have components of online learning. That this um, almost disruptive innovation of what technology is, and there's major examples of that in healthcare, how it's transforming healthcare, is really transforming education. And I better get on the band wagon and start a kind of learning about what this is. So my courses and my students, um, I teach two courses that I want to mention in this context. The first is um, in really actually was in 2015 with Maria Marconi, but I started teaching EDU 581 clinical teaching methods. And this is a course that is taught as a hybrid. There's seven face-to-face -face sessions that are live. Um, I currently, the last couple of years, have taught that with Eric Fredrickson and Andrew Wolf. Now, when you teach with Eric Fredrickson and Andrew Wolf, it's like teaching with the Yankees of online learning, right? Like, they're just good. You go, okay, you do that part, and I'll do the face-to-face, -face, and we'll be a good team. So even though that is an online course, I would say I was an online adjacent educator. I really didn't kind of engage in that piece because I had the Yankees taking over and I was t-ball and I was happy in that space. But more recently I've kind of delved in because um, Dr. Barassi has asked me to um, develop a course, EDU 582, which is Contemporary Issues in Health Professions Education. And I said, okay, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to push myself and throw myself into it. And it's going to be a fully online course, um, which I'm excited to say is going to be launched next month um, in the spring. And this will be fully online with some synchronous sessions on Monday evenings. And so when I talk about kind of lessons learned, I'm thinking in that context. 
So some of the things I wanted to share with you, and really I'm preaching to the choir, it feels almost like a poor man's version of Eric's course. <laughs> some of the things that we're teaching, this is what you learn in that, is that first and foremost, Blackboard is much more than a container. I've started to think about, I've done a lot of work thinking about clinical learning environments or learning environments in, um, in health professions education. As soon as I started thinking about online as this mosaic or canvas of a learning environment and all of the elements that I know about that, that I can, um, um, impose or transfer to it, like psychological safety and scaffolding um, and having um, engagement, that helped me my conceptualization of being an online teacher. Um, use a template. My mother was a fourth grade teacher and she said the best educators always beg, borrow, and steal other people's curriculum. Uh, get help, that there's wonderful templates out there um, that can help you structure um, so that you're also thinking about your own cognitive load as you're making this transition and moving into this space. Um, consistency equals scaffolding. This was a really hard mental model for me because if you work in the simulation world, every time you touch a curriculum, you're thinking about fidelity and adding and moving and changing and what's the coolest thing that you can do to really spark and engage. Um, but in online learning, I didn't want to be a vanilla teacher like Eric keeps telling you. I wanted to be saucy, right? And I wanted to try new apps, but I really learned and it was an aha for me that the consistency amongst the mo modules, the consistency throughout the course really does help scaffold and help support the students. And I think that's a huge important point for me. Uh, details matter in teaching. Sometimes I, um, if you know me, I like to move pretty fast and go pretty hard. Um, but if there's a detail there, I can make up for it or compensate for it. Not only can't the learners hide in online learning, but the faculty can't hide in online learning. And so really thinking about putting the time into that I think is important. Um, but I really appreciate the opportunity to front load the work um, and putting all of that energy up front because I think it makes the teaching more enjoyable once you're in the course. Then you can really just focus on your students and the engagement. Um, some lessons learned about teaching and online, and this is a little bit of a leap for me because I haven't taught the course that I'm telling you that I'm doing, but now thinking back on co-teaching with Eric, the feedback loop between online course activity and live or synchronous activity is going to be really important, and it's something I'm going to be mindful of. How much time do you spend in that FaceTime recapping what they should have already been doing versus how much of is that new content, um, and how are you structuring and connecting, and I think that's going to be a little bit of a dance, and I'm going to be um, interested in thinking about that. Um, building a supportive culture, a sense of community. I will tell you that the first couple of times Eric started his course by saying, is there any good news? I was like, does he really have to do this all the time? Like, don't we already know he's the nicest guy in the university? Like, <laughs> what, what is this really about? And all of a sudden, I got it. Like, he is nice, but he's doing it on purpose. And we were connecting, and I was excited to share my daughter's field hockey score to my friends in my Zoom session. And then that set up that partnership and working together later on. It was so important. So thinking about a supportive culture. Um, and it was already mentioned, nothing can be too clear for an online learner, which I think is really important. And then thinking about the faculty practice. I thought online learning would mute my voice, um, but now there's just so many other avenues for me to have um, my direction and guidance and feedback in there. It's, it's actually much more multi-dimensional than I thought it would be. So things that I'd like to leave with you and share with you is one, take Eric and Lisa's course. I think it is probably, it is the crown jewel of faculty development in higher education. I don't know anything similar to that and I just think it's so important and we need to think about faculty development models like that. It's just such an important um, piece. Um, find a friend. I think teaching can actually be a really isolating activity sometimes we really get into the bucket or the hole of thinking about what we're teaching in this journey that we want to go on um, but being a part of Eric's course um, helped give me a network to teach and I don't think I've had such a broad network when thinking about individuals so go find a friend when you're doing this I'll be your friend if you want Eric will be your friend I think that's an important piece um, plan ahead of time when you're doing it um, and that's really hard with our busy schedules and especially because when we're building new curriculum or content it's on the margin of our life of our responsibility responsibilities we already have. Um, at least in the Academic Medical Center, there's not time relief to create new. You're doing it in the in-between spaces. Um, but be kind to yourself and really build that out. 
consider the rhythm of your teaching. This is something I'm thinking about. I'm going to have to change the rhythm of my teaching about how I'm present with students and I'm blocking out my schedule and where I'm going to have that, um, um, that relationship with them and relationship with myself. And I'm and anticipating that that's going to feel different and I'm excited about that. Um, and lastly, or maybe second to last, it's totally doable. If I was sitting in this room four years ago, I'd be like, that's nice for her. <laughs> Um, but if I could tell you, it's totally doable um, and just go for it. So thank you for the opportunity to share.